the end of the year now, so this is typically when people start setting uh, New Year's resolutions and kind of reviewing the, the year past, you know, 2012, what worked, what didn't work, what goals were accomplished, what goals weren't. You know, in 2013, New Year's resolution, what am I going to do this year and what are the things that I'm going to work towards? And so that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was, you know, kind of the importance of that, but also kind of it's something that people kind of go through the motions of and there's a reason why the gyms are usually full for the first two, three weeks of January and then it kind of fades off. It's because there's, there's not, people a lot of times don't understand how to set goals and how to kind of change behavior that comes with it because that's really what goals are about is how to change behavior in a way that's going to make it sustain over a long period of time. And so if, if like you look on the, in any success in the, in the library or any bookstore, if you look through the success books, a lot of times what you're going to see is goal setting and goal planning and they're going to tell you kind of how to set goals and the different steps in, involved in that. But what they don't say is kind of how it affects your mind and how it, and it really uh, goes from there. So if you visualize for a second, you know, yourself, and I'm not even going to attempt to draw uh, a person and or horse or elephant or any of those things. So I'm going to use boxes. So if you imagine yourself riding a horse right now. Okay, so if, if you're riding a horse, uh, you know, there's the, the, the reins and the saddle and the whole bit. Now replace the horse with an elephant. And so a different size and scale of, of kind of what, what it's about. And, and a lot of, if you look at neurologically, a lot of this comes into play is kind of your, your conscious mind versus your subconscious mind. There's, a, there's an old metaphor that, and the reason why I had you visualize that, there's an old metaphor that's, that talks about how uh, that really your subconscious mind is, is like the equivalent of you riding an elephant. You think you can control it and you think that you can make it do what you want to do, but at the end of the day, the elephant controls what direction you're going to go and where you're going to go. Uh, but what comes with that is the ability to, once you understand the dynamics, is, is how can you control it, how can you change it, how can you modify it, how can you work with it. And so uh, I read a book a while ago called uh, uh, Habit, it's uh, The Power of Habits. It's by Charles Duhigg. And what he talks about in the, in the book is how to create habits because you know, most of our life is ran by our subconscious, and our subconscious is ran by our habits. And so how he considers what a habit loop is, you know, a, a few, th there's only three parts that are, are kind of in, involved in that. So you have your, your routine, your reward, and your cue. You know, and this just kind of self-perpetuates all the way through. And so what he talks about is how these sim three simple steps is, is, is if you identify how to create your habits, if you know how your habits are created, you, then you can change little pieces to make your habits better, stronger, faster, like Kanye. And, and so this is just like when we create systems in, in, in our business. You know, we talk about the systems wavelength. Is, is when you start breaking down into steps, now you can work on specific steps in the process as opposed to, you know, I want to get up, I want to work out, I don't get up, I don't work out. And so in this whole component here, you know, and, and when he was talking about in his book, where he had this revel revelation was for him at 3.30 every day, he would get up and go at his office, he would get up and go to the cafeteria and get a cookie. He felt, because he, he was feeling kind of uh, sluggish, kind of just kind of not in the, in the zone. So he would get up, go get a cookie. He'd feel better. He'd feel more energized. Uh, and then that was his reward. And then he would kind of continue that every day until he started collecting cookies around his midsection. You know? And so then he was like, all right, I got to figure this out. You know? And so what he realized, though, was it wasn't the, the act of going to get the cookie that was his real reward. It was the act of getting up out of his desk and going and socialize with people. So it was just an excuse to get up from his desk and go. You know, it's, and it's the same thing that you could probably see in this highly caffeinated office of, you know, anytime you feel kind of, kind of, uh, kind of drudging on a little bit, kind of getting a little lethargic, you get up, you get a cup of coffee, you feel energized, and then, you know, off you go. But probably if you, ident if you kind of broke it down, what you might see is when you feel stuck, when you feel lethargic, when you're feeling run down, you know, it could be, you know, your routine could now be this coffee, but it, it could be that it's just socialization. It could be that it's just 
you know, getting up and, and walking around. And so what he talks about in the book is, is, is play with the, these different things and see how they uh, affect your behaviors. Because what you might find is the act of getting up from your chair and walking over to the coffee pot and talking to three people along the way and two people on the way back might be really what you're after in this habit loop as opposed to, you know, caffeinating yourself. It may just be that you need the, the caffeine. But unless, until you identify and until you really uh, investigate it, you're really at the mercy of your subconscious because you just don't know. And so that's the, the big component here is, is identifying these little steps in the process. You know, for me, a big one, uh, you know, for, for running, I know on my uh, Tuesday mornings, I do my, my whiteboard time, that I have my scheduled time, that I do idea time with my whiteboard. Uh, I know for me that if I run before I try to think, my mind's clear, I can think more deeply, and I can, it gives me time to kind of process. And so now my reward is that when I get to my whiteboard time, I'm going to be able to think more clearly. I'm going to be able to hopefully have better ideas. And so now, on days that I have my whiteboard time scheduled, because sometimes I have to move it, I know inherently that preceding that is going to be me working out. And so that is something that is kind of, you can kind of identify the loop. So what I want to challenge you guys is to identify some of these habits that you have that you just take for granted. Because most of our life is, is ran by these habits, from the way that we get up and get dressed in the morning, the way that we drive to work, to the way we do uh, everything that we do. And once you figure out, so for me, like the whiteboard time equals workout equals clear mind. So now at this point, this becomes, you know, a full out plan because I know when this happens, I know that happens. And what does that sound like? You know, it sounds pretty similar to a system, right? And so it's in the same vein that we, this is why we have systems because you know, when you have this plan of doing something, it's a way that you consistently do the same thing. You know, it's just like when uh, you have the system, and if you do it the same way each time, what is that? That's, that's practice. You know, and then if you become practice, you uh, practice at something, what will end up happening is now you've, you've forced your subconscious to do something in a specific way. And when you force your subconscious to do something in a specific way, now at this point, you're your subconscious goes up while your conscious goes down. So now you don't have to think about it. I mean, if you think back to your first month here, you had to do lots of things in specific ways, and it was, had to be driven by your conscious mind. You had to focus on doing specific things in specific ways in specific order. Over time, it becomes a habit because you've become good at it, and now you can just do it without having to think about it. And when you're able to do this without having to think about it, at this point, you're, the, the energy that it takes to do this, it takes less energy to do it. And so it takes less willpower. And so if you're doing things subconsciously, you don't have to think about it. And so when it becomes hard to do something uh, in the way that it's supposed to be done, now if you do it without thinking about it, it just automatically does it. And so if, if you think about it from this perspective, you know, so this kind of whole thing, you know, when you think about it in sports, you've got a specific way that you're setting things up. You know, your coach is going to have you go out and practice the fundamentals. You know, if it's football, blocking and tackling. You know, you're going to have to understand uh, how footwork, how to position yourself, where, what things are going on. You know, and, and then after time, if you practice specific plays, so once you get the fundamentals of footwork and, and blocking and tackling, then you start, as a team, working together to, to practice specific plays to the point where you don't have to think about it. It just comes naturally. There's just a certain flow to it. You just kind of go with it, and everyone knows their role, and, and it just kind of all goes through it. Then at that point, the, the amount of effort and energy you have to put into it goes down. And so then at this point... your effective and efficiency goes up, right? Because now you're going to be more effective because it's consistent each time and you're, you know what to do, you know how to do it, and you don't have to think about it, so you can just kind of really go through it. And, and your efficiency is going to go way up because now you can, you can just do it. 
Uh, and the other element of it is your effectiveness can go up even higher because now you don't have to think about doing that step. So now you can start this whole process over again with something else and layer another layer of complexity over the top. So this is kind of the, you know, where we we're just talking about once you figure out how to block and tackle and, and do all the fundamentals, now you can layer on top of that a specific team play that you can work together and uh, focus on. And so the act of doing this is, you know, something that we've been working on recently is the systemized systems. Because isn't that what this is? It's a system to create systems. So it's a it's the, the plan to create and, and focus in making your habits better and making them stronger. And so what happens when you can do this systematically is, you know, willpower is a funny thing that, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's you're working out or eating better or, you know, starting a new project with a client, you've got to do, there's certain basic things that you have to do to get it set up. You know, if, if we get a new client, there's, there's a list of steps that we need to do in order to make sure that that client's going to go smoothly and onboard them correctly. But it takes time and it takes energy to make sure that you do that up front. And willpower is, is really just like anything else uh, is, is a muscle. And the more you work out this muscle, the stronger it's going to get. And so if you think about it from this perspective, each time that you kind of run this loop, you've made that muscle a little bit stronger. And so each time that you get better at this, you can take on more complex tasks because now that, that muscle's stronger. So you, know, you wouldn't go into the gym and start, you know, unless you're Andrew, benching you know, 225 without ever warming up or without ever doing anything. But you wanna, you wanna build up to that. You wanna build up reps, you wanna build up those sets. You know, if you're gonna get on the treadmill, you're not gonna, the first time you get on the treadmill, you're not gonna try to run five miles. You know, you're going to run a half a mile, you're going to run a mile, you're going to run two miles. And that's this whole iterative process of really working out that muscle. And so what you're going to find is when you start identifying these things and start making your habits more consciously created, you're going to get better at other things as well because you're going to start to see the patterns and things. You know, so I know I noticed on this, I noticed that at one point I was getting uh, lethargic and tired, and I was like, well, maybe I'll walk down to Mudhouse and get a, a smoothie. And I'm like, no, that would be not the reward that I'm looking for. Uh, you know, I don't want to get stuck in that habit loop. So, you know, then I created a new one to make sure that I knew what I could do to get that. You know, the pull-up bar, maybe. A, yeah. That's, you know, now yeah. on the third floor, a lot of times you're going to see people get stuck, they walk over to the pull-up bar. You know, Bradford now, when he gets up, he's, <laughs> he's trying to, to positively reward this. And so that's the, the goal then is to create routines and rewards that are positive in nature and not destructive in nature. Because that's a, a challenge that a lot of us fall in. It's easy to get into destructive because it's much, uh, it takes a lot less willpower to do something that's easy and destructive. And so over time what you're gonna find is the more you work out this, this muscle, the more disciplined and more focused you can be on, uh, on changing things everywhere in your life. So. Questions, comments, have you guys seen this in your lives? Oh, yeah. So what's an example of, of something that you've seen? Andrew? Uh, like the, the gym is a perfect example. <laughs> How do you see it play out? Well, you know, it's easier to, to lay in bed and relax and everything in your body is saying, hey, get some extra sleep. And uh, But it's one of those things where if that muscle gets strong enough, that switch is going to click where you're like, okay, just just get up, you know, just get up and do it because subconsciously, you know, Pavlov's dog is coming into play. You're going to get this reward afterwards where you feel amazing, like you're jacked for the rest of the day. So if you can just, the more you do that, the more that when you wake up in the morning, you're going to crave that reaction. So you're going to get up easier. Yeah. And then after a while, the, the reward is you know, kind of self-evident and, and it becomes its own yeah. reward. Instead of having to reward yourself to work out, reward becomes its own workout. You know, but at first, a lot of times you have to reward yourself with something. You know, that's something that, that Brian, I know, has been working on is, you know, he loves consuming content. He loves reading. He loves watching TED Talks. Does not necessarily love working out. You know, and so one of the things that we've been working on is kind of re-shifting that and refocusing that to where 
instead of calling it working out, it's content consumption. And so now when he's, if he's running, he's watching TED Talks. If he's you know, walking or on the bike, he's reading. And so then this becomes its own reward in its own right because now this is when he gets to consume content without, his, uh, without any uh, challenges of, of anyone else taking up that time with kids and family and all that. So it becomes uh, its own reward. And then over a while, after a while, it'll become working out will become its own reward as opposed to content having to be the, the, the kind of the, the carrot in front of it. Similar to Andrew and similar to what you just said, I noticed when I was uh, trained for the half marathon there, and I, sometimes it's hard to get up in the morning those days, but then it gets easier and easier. And you did notice that you were more focused than better the rest of the day. And for me, um, I, I like to run outside, so watching it, I, I can see the benefit of being able to do two things at once kind of do. But um, I guess the reward that I got out of that was I noticed I was less manic in my lifestyle. It was my time to kind of think about it all and put it all in perspective. And then when I was done, I could get the day running and had a plan. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a week. Yeah. So. And, and this plays out in a lot of other ways, not just working out too. I mean, just in your, how you do things professionally. You know, it's, you know, we touched on earlier, there's a lot of steps in how we have to set up a client to make sure that they're, they're good to go. And uh, you know, that becomes a challenge to, to really make sure that we can focus in on that. But what ends up happening is if it's set up properly, that customer is going to be happier. We're going to be able to do better work for it. The team is going to be able to work together better on it. You know, so there's an entire reward that comes out of it, and we need to make sure that uh, we're practicing the system to make sure that that becomes just uh, becomes part of what you do, and then after that, you can start to figure out ways to do it even better. So I know everybody's going to have like a different routine that's tailored mm -hmm. to them. What well, if like a destructive routine is more beneficial for you? Like, uh, and you know, I don't know, like you know, having a cigarette rather than having a glass of water, or you know, maybe a Red Bull instead of a water. You know, some people's like, I just have to have that because I can focus and I can do this yeah. and in all reality I guess healthier you know it would be a lot healthier to just down a you know big thing of water but you know well yeah. and same goes for people that work all week and they're like man I can't wait till Friday night we can go to uh, O'Malley's throw darts and get smiz ash That's right. part of it is I think uh, well, I know. part of it is identifying what the reward is that you're getting and then where this guy looked for a coffee, social walk, looked for what he was, he experimented over the course of four weeks or something and he kept a list of the things he did and how he felt afterwards. And so by consciously identifying this is the destructive loop that I'm in, uh, what am I getting out of that? If what you're getting is drunk and that's your reward, then uh, maybe you should see what you're getting from that if that's the problem for you. But so he identified that what he needed was just a break. Mm -hmm. you know, and so he stopped eating the cookies and he started socializing and it was helpful for him all around. So if what you're getting from like a horrible, horrible stick of cancer that makes everybody <laughs> sad is that little break and that little boost, then maybe have a cup of coffee and chat with somebody for a second. And that then over time you can break that association of the reward with the cigarette yeah. and have that reward associated with something productive that doesn't make us all sad. Uh, cool. So I would say that uh, the reward for me, I quit smoking and the reward when having a cigarette, sorry Jim, uh, is to like I have anxiety and so smoking a cigarette helps your anxiety because it calms you down but if you can uh, calm yourself down like or ease your anxiety without having a cigarette, the reward is that much better because you're in control of your own self. Same with coffee, if you can energize yourself without caffeine, I mean, with exercise or taking a walk or whatever, the eternal reward is mentally better because you know that if, not if there's not coffee around, you're gonna be able to be energized. If there's not a cigarette, then you're not gonna have an anxiety attack. Well, I think that we all see this too, um, with like the act of putting headphones in. Mm -hmm. Putting headphones in says now I'm going to concentrate <coughs> and like block out everything else. Yep. And then I think it gets to the point where that's 
that's a conscious or a subconscious effort to get yourself to focus. Right. Compared to if you don't ever bring headphones into the office, then you have to find some other way to sit down. Like, you know. Like, yeah, you're absolutely right. That it's part of it is blocking out the sound and blocking out that. But you're you're right that it's partially subconscious. Once headphones are in, that means focus in and, and concentrate. You know, so there could be other things that you could do instead of the act of putting headphones in. There could be other things that you could do to just as effectively generate that same habit loop. Um, when people are talking about caffeine and tobacco or whatever, what like role does like some sort of dependency or addiction have on the habit forming process, or is there? Will this help to kind of break that stuff up as well? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely physical components to addiction, you know, chemical addiction. So there's, but there's a lot of times people become, and this is where you feel, you hear that people are, are either physically addicted or emotionally addicted. You know, this is specific to emotional. Okay. Uh, but a lot of times you can wean yourself off physical, emotional. You know, there's lots of ways that have been documented of how to wean yourself off you know, physically, but the emotional component is sometimes more powerful than even the physical. And so then what you have to do is replace something that, uh, you, know, re you know, kind of experiment with routine and reward that's going to affect that emotional component. Then the physical component, hopefully over time as you're, as you're substituting, you know, if you went from 10 cigarettes to 9 to 8 to 7 with now 1, 2, 3 replacement things, hopefully over time that the physical dependency is replaced by the emotional new dependency of something else. Or like uh, trading one destructive habit for like a less destructive habit. Like sometimes instead It's like of, the opposite of a gateway drug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of eating, or instead of like smoking a cigarette, you like go grab a snack or something like that. To yeah, kinda, just make sure it's a healthy snack. Yeah. All right. I, I really like this whiteboard wisdom. And just to throw some science behind it, like all of like, Good and bad, they're all addictions. Like all of our practices and our, our systems are all addictions, are all habits. Like addiction is a negative connotation for habits that are harmful to your body. Uh, really, the when you break down even the, the system, uh, when you get your reward, it releases like your dopamine, all that stuff, your feel good stuff, same with the cigarette. Same with getting drunk, same with talking to somebody, same with working out. Uh, so really, like the working out and the socializing are on the positive aspect. And there are actually addictions. There are people addicted to working out. There are people addicted to socializing because they love that feeling they get. So it's that balance between both. It's also like a process, like with willpower. So I thought this is like one of my favorite ones so far. <coughs> I think I think what I think of addiction, I think of like too much of anything is bad. Mm -hmm. Like even working yeah. out, yeah, yeah, if you're right, too much, you're right, is bad. So I would, yeah, habit I think is a better like for working out. It's a good habit.